Um, Pastor Chris obviously is in Dominican Republic, and he asked me to, to speak to you guys today. So what we're going to talk about is P3. Now, some of you might know P3 is a program we use to hire Chris. It was a program within the Baptist Conference they had. i got to stand back a little bit because I'm hearing that. It was a program they have in the Baptist Conference that you enter all this information and what we need as a congregation. Chris enters a a bunch of information and what he needs in a congregation, and we're paired together, so P3. But what we're going to talk about today is in Luke 2. Who's ever read Luke 2 around Christmas time? I think just about everybody has. And we hear it so many times that we can sort of not hear it anymore, you know what I mean? You hear something over and over again. It's like hearing a song for the first time. The first time you hear a new song, it almost gives you goosebumps. And then it's your favorite song, so then we put it in our phones and we play it over and over and over every time we're mowing the lawn or in the car or whatever we're doing, and the song plays and it plays and it plays. And after a while, you don't get goosebumps anymore. And Well, after a while, if you hear it, you'll actually switch stations, right? So we can become sort of calloused when we hear something over and over again. So it's almost like when you do work. If, if you've ever used a, a shovel or a hoe or done something with your hands, the very first time you do it, maybe in the spring when you're going through the garden for the first time, your hands get sore and you'll get blisters. But as you work with that tool over and over again, your hands develop a callus. You know, you'll get these real hard spots in your hands. And, and that can be a good thing But it can be a bad thing, too, when we're talking about the Bible and Christmas stories. I don't know about you guys' house, but Christmas time at our house can be chaotic. We have kids, and many of you have had kids or have kids, and, and it's just a busy time of year with all the programs and all the events and all the things that you have to do or you feel you have to do in that season, not to mention Christmas presents and getting the food for Christmas dinner And everything involved with it, it can become a hectic time of year to the point when maybe when you read Luke 2, you don't really listen to it because you catch yourself wandering. Your mind can wander when you sit down for a second because you have this large list of things that have to be done in your head. And just maybe you sit there and somebody's reading Luke 2. I I don't know if it's a tradition in your house, but we've made it a tradition. Greg and Kathy had it a tradition. Beanie and Doris, I've heard Beanie read it. It's something that's to be treasured, but if you're a little too busy, it can get by you. And it's unfortunate because the story in Luke 2 is perhaps the beginning of the most amazing story were ever to be told. You know, I asked the youth group last week or a couple weeks ago what traditions they have. And there were quite a few that raised their hands. And we had various traditions, and traditions are great. Some read Luke 2. um, Some have turkey. Some have ham for dinner. Uh, One uh, says they have smoked fish. So uh, that was kind of neat. And we just went through all the traditions. So we went ahead and read Luke 2 because not everybody has that tradition of reading Luke 2. And I just asked everyone to sit quietly while I read it because... Again, we can develop calluses, and it's like that song we've heard a hundred times. So you're probably cringing a bit when you think, you know, we're after Christmas here, and we're still going to talk about Luke 2. But what I'm going to focus on is the latter part of the story, uh, verse uh, 17 through 20, towards the end of the story, maybe the part of the story that doesn't get read as often. And I'm debating whether I should read Luke 2 or not because we're so callous. But I'm going to read seven. I'm going to start at 16 here. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger, and they are the shepherds. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured these things up and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told in the fields. So the three Ps we're going to talk about are pondering, praising, and proclaiming the Word of God. After Christmas, it's a really good time to ponder, just like Mary did. Mary, in case you missed it... um, Oh, where is it here? Mary treasured up all the things and pondered them in her heart. 
She sat there and pondered all that the shepherds were saying because she knew her part of the Christmas story. And her part of it <clears throat> was hectic, chaotic, and a little bit out of control. Think about it from her and Joseph's point of view. They were to be married. They weren't married yet. They were, they were engaged. And at, in that day and age, it was as good as marriage, only they couldn't try to have a child. They had to remain pure until the day of marriage. But if they were to break off this engagement, it was like a divorce, and it was, it, it was ugly. And, and now Mary is being told that she's going to have a child while still a virgin. So she's a biblical woman. You can tell when, when the angels visit her, she has biblical background. So she's got to be insanely nervous about the prospect of being married or not married yet and pregnant. It could end up a death sentence for her in that day and age if you were found to be pregnant and engaged and it wasn't your husband, Joseph. He could say, that's not my child, and you could be stoned to death for that. So hectic is maybe a mild word to what Mary was feeling. And then on top of that, you know, we, we think of the Christmas story, or at least I did when I started preparing for this, and I, I catch myself thinking they're riding a donkey to Bethlehem from Nazareth to have a baby. But really, if we stop and think and ponder this for a moment, they were simply going to pay taxes to Rome. And this trek, if you look at your maps, and a lot of Bibles have maps in the back, if you look at your map in the back of your Bible, Nazareth is up here, and Bethlehem is way down here in Israel. And in the middle of that is this area called Samaria. And we know in Luke, later in Luke, the disciples weren't welcomed in Samaria. So, yeah, it's a 70-mile stretch as the crow flies, but after doing some research, I found out that that trip could have taken more than a week because it would have been well over 70 miles. In fact, they would have crossed the Jordan River and gone down another way and then back into Samaria when they were closer to Bethlehem because of the treatment they would have received in that land being Jewish. So when you think about that, think about her maybe close to nine months pregnant and... I know if I was to take Tanya <laughs> on a donkey ride in her eighth to ninth month, and that would have been bad enough. Let's say we're at the Grand Canyon and we're going to tour it for a couple of hours. She would have already said, are you crazy? But now I throw this on her. Well, we're actually going camping for a week <laughs> on donkey. She would have thought I was insane. But that was the only means of transportation they had. So now add the complication of pregnancy to this, and you could have stretched into 10 days from what I read. Because, you know, you have to have potty breaks when little baby Jesus is pushing on your bladder. And you got to do all these other things. So it could have been a very long, dangerous journey to pay taxes. Now, we go on the same camping trip, and then I tell Tanya, we don't even have a place to stay. There's no place to stay. The, the campground's full, so we're going to just make do with what we have. I mean, the entire process of this is quite remarkable, really, in, in many ways. Um, if you think about it from that, from that viewpoint, it can, you know, because I tend to overlook it a lot. I tend to just read the story out of Luke 2 and don't really, really think about what was going on around them. And, you know, that callus that builds up, it can be, it can be good and bad. Because let me tell you a story. There's a, there's a chemical professor and his chauffeur. And he's being driven around uh, from city to city giving speeches. He's really acclaimed and he gives these speeches. And he must rehearse them in the back of the car because they're going to this one location and the chauffeur said to the professor that, you know, I could, I could give that speech. And the professor was kind of arrogant. He goes, you couldn't give this speech. You're just a car driver. There's no way you could. The chauffeur says, I, I'll bet you 50 bucks I could give that speech. All right, you're on. So the chauffeur pulls the car over just shy of uh, the location they were going to. And they switch clothes. And the chauffeur is now wearing the tuxedo. And the chemical professor is wearing the chauffeur outfit. And away they go. And they get there, and the chauffeur gets whisked to the head table of the event there, and he gets there, and they call, a, call 
the professor's name, and he goes up and gives the speech flawlessly. And they, he, he was kind of proud of himself at that time. He just, there was no errors. It was exactly as the professor would do. Only he made the mistake of leaving a little bit of time at the end. He didn't pause, maybe was a little bit nervous and spoke too quickly. And uh, the MC of the event said, oh, look, we're blessed with some additional time here. Anybody have questions for the professor? <laughs> and the first person stands up and they're handed the mic and they start asking, he asks a question of the professor, of the chauffeur. And he goes, you know, that's one of the dumbest questions I've ever heard. I'm going to let my chauffeur answer that. <laughs> but you see, we can hear a story over and over again and not really learn what it's about. So let's, I guess maybe we're going to have to do it next year now, but try to pull the calluses off. I know I catch myself when I, I hear songs. Tanya does a great job of selecting songs. But when I hear songs, I try not, well, I don't sing them anymore because I try to understand what the words are saying. And it's helped me a lot um, in, well, any time of year, but Christmas especially because Christmas songs are the same way as Luke too. We can hear them so many times that we don't really hear the message that they're trying to convey anymore. And uh, C.S. Lewis said something once. He said, we don't need to be told new ideas so much as we need to be reminded of old truths. And I guess that's what I'm trying to say is the old truth is that God gave himself to us born as one of us, that each of us might be born again into the family of God. And that's, that's pretty amazing if you think about the God of the universe, the God that made everything around us, did all that for you. And I say you, because so often we can hear these stories and we can blow them off is the world. God gave his only son to the world so that whoever believes should not perish. But I want you to, I'm going to read John 3.16 for a second here because we do this with the youth group every once in a while and I think it has good meaning. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Yeah, you gave your son for the world, great. But what we have the youth group kids do every once in a while, and it, I think it helps everyone because I know it, it helped me. For God so loved Kevin that he gave his one and only son for him so that if Kevin would just believe, he's not going to perish, but he's going to have eternal life. It has a lot more meaning that way, doesn't it? There's a, there's a part of Luke, and the reason I'm saying that, there's a part of Luke... Oh, I'm getting feedback from that terrible... Um, and I'm going to read Luke 10 to you, okay? And he says here that, But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news and great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior is born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. You've heard that before. But I want you to listen for a particular word, and I'm going to read it again when I say this. Listen for the word you, and think of you, because it's so easy to think of the world or think of the shepherds when you hear this. The angel said to the shepherds, I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. A Savior has been born to you. This is a sign for you. You will find the baby. The angel's message to the shepherds was that Jesus is your Savior. And that's what gets lost in the message. You know, when the, when the shepherds heard this, they could have done nothing. They could have stayed out there. I don't know how they would have when you see the light from the sky and the angels singing to you, but they could have stayed there. They didn't. They went and praised. And that brings us to our second point. Do not bring, uh, the angel said, uh, I bring you good news. Sometimes we focus on, I lost my place here. The angels came in and talked to Mary. And when Mary heard the news, she pondered what they were saying. When, we, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had just said. 
amazed in many ways because the shepherds were, were not religious. They weren't allowed in church. They were dirty. They were unclean. But they're preaching a story right out of Isaiah. And how did they know this? Well, the angels visited them. So now they're out there. They're proclaiming the word of God. They're praising God. And Mary ponders this, and she saves it in her heart. Because part of the story is that we praise. We take a moment, and we remove the calluses from our ears and our eyes and our hands, and we praise God in that moment. But the third part might be the most important part of the entire story. Because the third part is proclaiming what we've known and what we hear. Treasuring the Christ is something we do not keep to ourselves, but by making him known to the whole world. It's a quote from C.S. Lewis. Proclaiming Christ. How many of us proclaimed Christ this Christmas season? I know I didn't. Proclaiming what you know. Because the light of God, and it's talked about in Isaiah where it talks about the light of Christ, is not like the sun. The light they're talking about is more like a candle or a flashlight. It's good for the person holding it. They can see their way. But it needs to be handed to the next person for them to see. So maybe it's better to think of it as a candle where you can, like we do at the service of lights, where you can light the next person's candle with it. So often I think when I think of it, I think of the, the light coming out of the, a darkness into the light. I think of it as a sun, but think of it as a candle. If we don't proclaim what we praise, then the meaning is lost. It, it stops with us. It dies right there. There was a guy in Italy. His name is Luigi Tarisio. There we go. And he was a poor man, so everyone thought. And he died... And they were cleaning out his house, and they went up into the attic of this little house. And in that attic, they found 100, 246 violins. Luigi had been collecting violins his entire life. In fact, I'm sure many of you have heard of a Stradivarius. It's like a coveted, it's the New England Patriots of violins. He... He had a Stradivarius in his collection amongst the 246 others. And they say that some of these hadn't been played for over 100 years. And they just sat in his attic collecting dust or hidden in a drawer. I actually found the Stradivarius wrapped in old shirts in the bottom drawer of a dresser up in the attic. And they took the Stradivarius out and they played it. And it sounded remarkable. You know, the, the unfortunate part is that Stradivarius, which I guess in the world of violins is a remarkable sounding instrument. And it's a shame that it had to sit in a dark cupboard or drawer for over a hundred years. You know, the, the word of God can be a lot like that, can it? We can have something incredibly special. But if we don't share it with anyone, it really doesn't do anybody any good, does it? It's a lot like the music of a Stradivarius. You have to share it, play it, for it to be appreciated. People die daily. And we have a lot of people in our church that are sick and... We've had people in our church pass away. The problem with death is you don't know when it's going to occur. It happens, sometimes suddenly. And you're never totally prepared for it. The sharing of the gospel has to be on the front of our mind all the time. It has to be something we think about continuously. Because in the blink of an eye, something can happen. And I tell the kids this a lot in youth group, that the most dangerous part of their day is leaving and going home. Because teenage drivers, it's one in five chance of an accident when they've been driving for less than a year. One in five will be in an accident, and I don't know what the statistics are for fatalities. I haven't gotten into that part of it, but sometimes we take things for granted in our daily life. 
the gospel, Luke 2, driving. But those things can change your life, all of those. My point is, we need to say it, share the message of the gospel. We need to share the Christmas story. This is our time of year. This is the Super Bowl for Christians. This is it. The entire world, most of the world, focuses on Christmas. And here we are, Christians, and many of us haven't shared the gospel, or at least the Christmas story, where it can spawn questions and conversation. I'm going to close with this. During the American Revolution, there was a battle of Blue Licks. Blue Licks was a river, a creek, and there was a battle there. And this battle ended up being fairly bloody. It was in Kentucky, and it went on for a few days, I think about a week, and a lot of people lost their lives. The unfortunate part of the Battle of Blue Lick was it should have never been fought because the war was over, but information was slow to travel in that day and age. The war had already been declared over weeks before they fought the battle. They didn't know. Nobody told them, or news hadn't got to them yet. You know, in a lot of ways, the gospel can be the same as the news that traveled during that time. If we don't share it, it really slows the growth of a Christian church, of the Christian community. So many people think that sharing the gospel becomes something that Pastor Chris is supposed to do, or Sunday school teachers with the kids they have, or the youth pastor. It's kind of their responsibility. And yeah, th there might be some truth to that. Maybe there is more responsibility, but ultimately we're all called to be disciples. And being a disciple is proclaiming the news of Jesus Christ. So with 2020 coming, perfect vision, maybe our vision should be to share the gospel at least more than we did last year, which could be once. Maybe it's instead of 100 times, I'm going to do 105 times, whatever the case is. But maybe with 2020 coming, that should be our goal is to be maybe better disciples because it's easy to be a Christian sometimes, but I think it's more of a challenge to be a disciple. I'm going to close with this video. Imagine Christmas is over. All the programs have been performed. All the pictures have been taken. The carolers are done singing. The holiday parties have come and gone. The presents are unwrapped. And the big dinners have all been eaten. The Christmas music is turned off. The family's headed back home. Someone from work is on the phone. The kids have a practice to get to. The house needs to be cleaned. The bills still need to be paid. The groceries are running low. The stock market is still down and up and down. The TV is still on. The news is still worrisome. Life just keeps going as if Christmas never happened. But it did happen. Look around. 
The church is full of family and friends and laughter because the baby is still the Savior. And the Savior is still the gift held out to a world still looking for joy, an earth still waiting for peace, and the peaceful still sing in wonder of the God who gave his Son and the Son who gave his life to add us to his family and one day welcome us home. Imagine Christmas is over. But remember that it really happened. And it changed everything. I'll just close with a quick prayer and we'll get going.